thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I would say that talking about small bowel tumors, I need a couple hours. So this will be an abbreviated version if you ever want to see more look at CTSS. But I thought I'd cover some of the highlights. I think, you know, small bowel tumors in general are not that common, but I think it gives radiology a great opportunity to make some uh, early diagnosis. People talk about how from presentation to diagnosis, small bowel tumors often take six to 18 months. And at that early phase, they're very resectable. In the late phase, they're metastatic. I think it's challenging in imaging. It's also challenging to the referring clinician. So it really is an issue. The ability to detect small bowel tumors is very much related to protocols. I think uh, all of us look back at scans where the lesions were missed initially, and you could see why people miss them. But protocol is really everything, like with most of CT. Um, we used to give positive contrast for looking at small bowel routinely. Now we use water as a contrast agent. I like to give about 1,000 cc's over about 20 to 30 minutes. And then we use IV contrast, like to inject about four to five cc's a second. That works very nicely. I'm looking for small bowel tumors, uh, and I'll show you why over the length of the talk. I like to do dual phase imaging. We don't do non-contrast CT. I don't see a need for delayed phase, but arterial roughly at about 30 or 35 seconds and venous coming back at about 70 seconds works very well. That really optimizes a combination of lesion detection as well as lesion discrimination. I'll also show you that if you only look at axial images, that's probably the number one reason for missing small bowel tumors. Particularly smaller tumors will be missed if you don't at least at a minimum look at the coronal views. And I think 3D, as I'll show you, particularly MIP and volume rendering can be very helpful. And just a simple example, looking at this case, do I see a duodenal mass? And if you look really hard, and I this was read initially as negative, if I pick the one area, that's the best area. That's a one centimeter enhancing lesion, which was a carcinoid. You can, if you're lucky, pick it up on the axials, but look at the coronal and look at the volume rendering. You see, it's a very flat lesion. So on an axial, it can be really hard to see, but when you look at it on a, on a coronal, be it MPR or volume rendering, it makes it very easy to see. And here's two more looks at that. So lesions that are flat are hard to see unless you go to other planes. You can see also the vascularity. We'll speak about vascularity of lesions. Carcinoids and their endocrine tumors are typically vascular. Things like uh, adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, typically hypovascular. Now, I'll just show you that regardless of the protocol, you can miss things. This was initially read as negative, and you could imagine um, Whoever was reading this study basically made the assumption this was unopacified bowel. Uh, but, you know, when you go back and you look at the coronals, you realize all the bowel was uh, opacified with positive contrast. This really is a mass sitting in the root of the mesentery arising off the bowel. Now, in saying that, you can see how easy it was to miss. Now, patient comes back six months later, and the fact is here we used water no IV, no, no oral contrast. If you look very quickly, perhaps you might not recognize something, but if you look at the MIP, you see the enhancement and some feeding vessels into the lesion. And then here it is in the coronal view. Again, much more obvious, that's the vascularity of the lesion, which you can see nicely, particularly as you narrow the window a little bit. So. I think even something is like this, a five centimeter mass, you need to be very careful. It's very easy to overlook small bowel tumors. We always think about small bowel tumors as obstructing bowel, but the reality is many of the lesions we speak about grow exophytically, many of them are small. And if you're waiting to see bowel obstruction, you're gonna miss a lot of lesions. So just some comments, small bowel tumors I mentioned, variable clinical presentation from the acute abdomen, though many of them are just patients with vague abdominal pain, which explains the difficulty of diagnosing them at times. People talk about a 5% uh, of frequency, but I think many of the tumors will vary depending on the population. If you look at some of the SEER data, you can see small bowel cancers, number 23 on the list, about 10,000 cases a year.
And the average age is about 65, which is basically the same age as almost every primary tumor. When I think about um, varying tumors, we think about four big tumors, adenos, carcinoids, lymphoma, and sarcomas. And then I would typically add metastatic disease. The numbers have changed over time. Neuroendocrine tumors, is not clear if they're just occurring more frequently or we're picking them up when they're smaller. Before we had a hard time seeing them. One argues whether, depending on the article, be it pathology or radiology or surgery, what's more common, adenos or carcinoids. But again, they're the top lesions. And so let's look at them in sort of some sequential order. One of the issues with adenocarcinomas is, is there's a range of appearances. If you look at the beginning, diffuse infiltration of a small segment is the most challenging to pick up. And of course, large ulcerating lesions are the easiest to pick up and the patients are more likely symptomatic and everything in between. Typically, we like to think about adenocarcinoma <clears throat> as being more proximal. We think about carcinoids being more distal, lymphoma being more distal. We know they're associated with some diseases, increased incidence in Crohn's, and increased incidence in sprue, and increased incidence in familiar polyposis. There's lots of work relating diets, and particularly cured foods, to an increased risk of small bowel tumors. Presentation again, is very variable, which makes it difficult. The patients you pick up a little bit earlier, perhaps, if they have GI bleeding and you're evaluating them. But from a clinician's perspective, it's very much this vague abdominal pain, not focally related. Sometimes you'll see a scan for pancreatic cancer because of suspected weight loss. Sometimes they do endoscopy, upper endoscopy, and then colonoscopy, and they find nothing. So that's that delay I mentioned of six to 18 months. Now, from a radiology perspective, you can see the problem. This patient had vague abdominal pain, and this study was originally read as negative. And just look at the duodenum. And you can think to yourself, is this abnormal? Is this just normal? Is there something enhancing here? Is this dilated? Maybe it's nothing, but I will admit it's hard to be certain. But if you take that image and you look at the coronal view, now you see basically from the second portion of duodenum to the fourth portion, this infiltration. There's no obstruction, but this infiltration, and that infiltration is, is so easy to see in the coronal view. <clears throat> again, the point, the axials can be different, difficult. Or look at this case. This again was read as negative. Look really hard at the third portion of duodenum. Now you could say, well, maybe you're overcalling something. Is this thickened here? Well, it looks different than the fourth portion. But then when you go from the axials to the coronals, you see the nodularity in the third portion of the duodenum. Again, you can see here the importance of good, gastric, of good distension of a stomach and small bowel. Again, the water is critical to distend it. And then here you see very nicely the nodularity in this patient with adenocarcinoma. Here it is again on the volume rendering. Again, that infiltration, the difference of folds. This is a small tumor. This patient should do great. It's maybe a couple centimeters, but there's no obstruction and it's very easy to miss. If the duodenum was not distended, you surely would walk by this case without any problem. Now, obviously other cases are easier. This patient had abdominal pain and weight loss. And you can see here the patient's duodenum is dilated. There's an infiltrating tumor. This patient had a scan that was very subtle about six or eight months earlier, but now you can see when the patient presents, the patient has liver meds. So really it's too little too late. So when you have obstruction and infiltration, often you are gonna see distant disease, whether it's in the omentum or mesentery or to the liver. And sometimes the tumors are bulky. Here's a tumor infiltrating just past the ligament of trites into the proximal jejunum. You can see the soft tissue thickening. Again, good distension of duodenum. And then you see the transition point as you get into the proximal jejunum. This is a little bit dilated. And then you see the infiltration by tumor. So again, the importance, again, going beyond the axial plane. And I've been doing some work with cinematic rendering, looking at this, looking at folds, uh, red is, you see the color of uh, fluid, and then you see the infiltration into the wall of the patient's jejunum, nicely shown, and here's one more image. So we are looking and trying to figure out some of the uh, 
post-processing can help avoid some of the errors that we do make. Second tumor to mention is carcinoid tumors, range of um, spectrum of disease, but they have a pretty good signature. The thing about carcinoids, they can be incidental findings. On the flip side, they can present with bowel obstruction and perforation. They can present with METS and carcinoid syndrome. So it's a range of presentations. We typically think about small bowel carcinoids and say, well, they're typically in the distal small bowel, but the fact is, there are really two sets of carcinoids, the duodenal carcinoid and then the typical uh, ileal carcinoid. The duodenal carcinoids are a bit atypical or have their own uh, appearance in the sense they're smaller, they're vascular. They don't typically present with carcinoid syndrome, okay? And they really present with liver metastasis. They're more common in patients who have neurofibromatosis, one. These lesions are small, and I think at times they're challenging to distinguish from things like GIST tumors, as I'll show you. They can be periampulary and actually present with jaundice in the patient because they obstruct the common duct. And then, of course, there's the ileal or jejunal carcinoids, but typically ileal. And there we think about seeing a mass in the small bowel as well as a mass in the mesentery. And the mesenteric mass, which is typically enhancing, also has a desmoplastic reaction. Those mesenteric masses, 75% of them has calcification. So you begin to have a typical appearance. So one thing I always remind people is when you're looking at suspected carcinoid tumors or you're thinking about carcinoid tumors, look very carefully because they're often multiple and also look very carefully into the mesentery for a mesenteric mass and also look at the liver. Now, when you have metastasis from carcinoid tumors, like most neuroendocrine tumors, the METs are best seen in arterial phase imaging and can easily become isodense. Although carcinoids can be small, there was an article by Kamui a couple of years back that made the point they looked at lesions five to 30 millimeters in size, and their accuracy was 100% uh, in terms of sensitivity and then 96% specificity and a really a negative predictive value of 100%. So you can see if you do really well, you could pick up lesions. Now in saying that, you need to be very careful. Look at this one set of images, and I'm telling you this patient has a neuroendocrine tumor, carcinoid tumor in the duodenum, first portion. And if you look and you have this magic arrow, there's the lesion right there. But if you looked at the coronal view, look how much more obvious it is. It's enhancing, very well defined. You could imagine why these can be detected incidentally if a patient was getting uh, endoscopy for a different reason. You could pick these lesions up. There it is on the cinematic right next to the GDA. Here's another example. Here's a little over a one centimeter lesion sitting in the second portion of the duodenum. It has slight enhancement. What else could you think about? I guess uh, adenocarcinoma, but that's kind of um, usually not so well defined like that, but it could be. You might also think about a GIST tumor, and I'll cover that in a moment, but there's the lesion nicely shown there. And you can see when I change it in 3D in the window, it's enhancing, though the enhancement is more in the wall. There's maybe a little bit necrosis centrally, but it's right in the duodenal wall. Another example, you can imagine how quickly you can bypass this lesion, but look at the arrow. Look at that lesion that barely measures a centimeter. I zoomed it up a little bit here in the duodenum, third to fourth portion, right there. And now look at in the coronal view. So you can see that you can pick up very small lesions. Remember, if you see something enhancing in the wall of the bowel, you can have varices at times, you can have angiodysplasia, but solitary lesions, you better be thinking about a neuroendocrine tumor as your first bet. Another example here. Now you could see um, in this case where things can go wrong. Again, um, we saw this on an, uh, on an outside scan and was missed. Now your experience like mine is that if something's missed, it's always on an outside scan. We don't know who those outside people are, but they're not very good. But you can see why patient didn't have any bowel obstruction and maybe they just weren't that impressed that there was something in this area. But you can see when you go to the coronal, these are volume rendered. Look at that pedunculated mass coming off the third portion of the duodenum, right off the wall. Again, look at very nicely the folds of the duodenum, but that's the mass really nicely seen.
So again, getting away from that axial plane, here it is in cinematic, there's the mass pedunculated. This was eventually resected, but nicely shown. Now, I mentioned about mesenteric masses. Here's a patient duodenum enhancement, and then here there's a mass, maybe you think it's pancreas, but it's really beneath the pancreas. Here it is again. And then if you look carefully on the MIP imaging, portal vein to SMV, and the SMV is cut off, bunch of collaterals. This is the desmoplastic reaction of a carcinoid tumor involving bowel and involving the mesentery. And again, it could simulate different things. Here it is again, another coronal view. Another example. Now, one of the things about the mesenteric mass is if you see a mass in the root of the mesentery, you look at this case for a moment, it's enhancing a bit. You could say a desmoid tumor. You could say enlarged nodes like lymphoma but you gotta be thinking about carcinoid. Now, neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoids, sometimes you see the mass in the mesentery and it's hard to find the primary mass in the small bowel. If you go back a number of years, the articles would say at best you saw 20% of the lesions, but here we go a bit further. Now, it also makes this into a carcinoid and not sclerosis mesenteritis or a desmoid tumor is the desmoplastic reaction, which you can see here and that beating into the mesentery is very classic. You also can see there's encasement of branches of the SMA. These tumors are not resectable because of that. Actually, the primary is right here, but look at the desmoplastic reaction. Look at all of those vessels nicely shown on the MIP imaging. Or another example, here's a patient. The first thing we found was this mass in the mesentery slightly enhancing, not the most impressive desmoplastic reaction I've ever seen, but then take a little bit better look right here. There's something enhancing in the bowel there. And then if you look harder, you can see there's masses in the terminal ileum. And there's several masses. The patient had multiple carcinoid tumors with a desmoplastic reaction with the mass in the mesentery. You can see everything and you put it all together. Enhancing lesion, mass in mesentery, classic for carcinoid tumor, nicely shown. And again, you could see at times MIP imaging of volume rendering brings out the subtleties in the smaller lesions. Now, the next lesion I wanna talk about are GIST tumors. It's the most common mesenchymal neoplasm of the GI tract. It's something that I used to have very few cases of, but we see it very frequently now. Uh, they can begin as small masses, but they can be very large. When they're small, they're typically hypervascular and often present with GI bleeding. When they're larger, they present with bowel obstruction occasionally, but vague abdominal pain. It's interesting, gist tumors, um, because they grow exophytically typically, kind of like gastric gist tumors, um, obstruction is relatively rare. The bleeding is interesting. The bleeding lesions I've seen are tumors in the one to two centimeter range and they're very bright in the patient's presentation with GI bleeding and it's an unsuspected finding. We do lots of CT for GI bleeding, ranging from diverticulitis to whatever the cause might be, but small bowel tumors, particularly GIST tumors, are one of the things. GIST tumors are unique from a PATH perspective, uh, KIT receptor CD117 positive, um, so we know that's how you can recognize them pathologically. But from an imaging perspective, they also tend to have a really typical appearance. So we'll look at some of them. Now, one thing is I do like to say that sometimes there are great mimickers. Here's a mass that was sent in. You can see the mass by the head of the pancreas. And this was actually sent to us the pancreatic conference as a pancreatic mass. But, you know, there's no dilated ducts. So it's not going to be an adeno. You can have a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, but they're usually very vascular. And what is this? You can see it here on the coronal views. It's pushing on the patient's portal vein, but it's not invading the portal vein. There's subtle enhancement present. It's, and then you look at the arterial phase. The vessels are kind of stretched to touch. There's some abnormal vascularity here, but there's not any vascular invasion. And this was a GIST tumor. A common location for GIST tumors, particularly large GIST tumors, is in the patient's duodenum. Now, that lesion was not very vascular. As I mentioned, you can see very vascular gist tumors, 
occasionally the very large, but mostly the very small. And you can see the article, this one article by um, Kay made the point that there's a wide range of enhancement of just tumors between different, uh, in different phases, as well as different tumors. Now at times, just can be tricky. They do look like or simulate neuroendocrine tumors. As I mentioned, they're often referred in when they're in the duodenum as a pancreatic mass. When you look fast here, you could say, oh, this is a neuroendocrine tumor rising off the pancreatic head near the uncinate. But when you start looking a little bit closer, you recognize that that mass is really in the patient's duodenum. And that was duodenal gist tumor. It's very easy to be confused with those lesions at times. Here it is again, just a few more views. Here you very nicely see the GDA and gastroepiploic arteries being involved by the patient's tumor but you can see why it's kind of tricky. You also see in this case, what makes it tricky in part is that gist tumors are exophytic, which nicely there. And here's just some of the cinematic, again, showing you some of the changes. We've been looking at trying to um, uh, grade gist tumors based on their texture map, and there's a bunch of work being done other places. Another example of a gist tumor, again, think about pancreas for a second, but this is coming off the duodenum and it's exophytic. You can see in this case, the vascularity. So good example, this patient had GI bleeding as their initial presentation, and there's no great surprise. But again, it can be confused, okay, with a, with a uh, primary pancreatic tumor. They're nicely shown here. Another example, patient with GI bleeding. Here's a mass in the patient's jejunum. You can see it here on these two views. It looks mainly intraluminal. Here's the enhancement pattern. And you can see why this patient had a GI bleed. When you start looking carefully at the lesion, um, you recognize that the lesion has a, it's really growing in an exophytic component. So for me, when I see a vascular lesion in bowel, I'm thinking of three things. I'm thinking of carcinoid gist and metastasis. When the lesion looks like it's growing exophytically like this, then I'm always going to favor a gist tumor in that regard. And here it is again. You can see on that view, it looks like it's intraluminal, but other views, it looks like it was exophytic. So you can see there's this overlap between adenocarcinoma, occasionally pancreatic head masses and uh, gist tumors, and also occasionally lymphoma as well. And I'll show you in a moment. Now, I mentioned this gist tumors get larger. They're not very vascular. You can see in this case, this almost looks like unopacified bowel, right lower quadrant. That was actually a five centimeter mass. Look how easy it is to miss. It's exophytic off the small bowel, off the terminal ileum. Again, notice there's no bowel obstruction. Okay, nicely shown there on the volume rendering. Or another example here, look at the size of this tumor. Not hard to recognize as a large mass there, but you don't know if it's a mesenteric mass like lymphoma, but this was a gist tumor rising off the terminal ileum. Again, it's large, it's exophytic, which explains the lack of bowel obstruction. You also see some of the modeled enhancement. I mentioned that it's hard to separate at times from adenocarcinoma. I read this case, it looked like an adenocarcinoma to me. It's a liver met, unfortunately. And this was a gist tumor, but looks really very much like an adenocarcinoma. So at times, I think you're gonna be good at picking up the mass not quite as good at defining it. Here you can see some of the jejunal vessels being encased. And again, I like the MIP imaging. They also find that very helpful for the surgeon. And here involving some of the uh, jejunal veins as well as jejunal arteries. I mentioned they can be very large. Look at the size of this mass. Very hard to figure out where this mass is coming from. Lots of vascularity. Look to me like some sort of vascular sarcoma. Look at the size of that mass. Believe it or not, with these just tumors, they'll treat with Gleevec and then they'll operate. In this case, the surgeon wanted the vascular mapping. You can see the large tumor on cinematic. Look at the vascularity of that lesion. Uh, the surgeon used this as a guide and this was resected. Here's another one. This actually looks like a big sarcoma. This actually was a just tumor coming off the terminal ileum. There really is no way to make that distinction. Um, I've seen just tumors 50 kilograms in size, just a huge mass. There it is stretching out the patient's SMA. 
And this was eventually resected. Unfortunately for this patient, there's ascites already and there was a tumor spread. And here's just one more example of a smaller lesion where the patient's lesion basically presented as GI bleeding. So just a, a very nice example. And again, I do make the point with our own residents and fellows as well that I do like to use the MIP imaging to look for those tumors. Last thing I'll just comment on is lymphoma. Typically, B-cell lymphoma are the things we see. Uh, more common in certain patients, uh, immunosuppressed patients, AIDS patients. Uh, a range of appearances from an infiltrating lesion to large endoexenteric masses. Sometimes lymphoma, as in this case, presents with bowel obstruction, though most of the time it doesn't. This patient, you can see the dilated loops of small bowel, and you see a mass in the right lower quadrant. I thought perhaps this might be an adenocarcinoma or maybe a mass arising from the patient's uh, cecum, like an adenocarcinoma of the colon, growing into the patient's small bowel. This, you can see the tumor here in the distal ileum as well as in the cecum. This on surgery was lymphoma. So lymphoma does cross the ileocecal valve. It's one of the things to think about, just a really nice example. Um, but again, lymphoma is not the most common thing to cause obstruction, even when it's large. And here's a good cinematic rendering look at that. Okay, nicely shown here. Um, patient who had uh, AIDS and patient had chest pain. And actually the first images, you can see this infiltration of a tumor involving the left and right atrium. I thought maybe the patient had an angiosarcoma. When you scan the patient's abdomen, there it is again, a really impressive tumor. When you scan the abdomen, you saw this ulcerating lesion in the terminal ileum. So it ended up this patient had lymphoma involving the small bowel and involving the heart. Lymphoma, particularly in HIV and AIDS patients, multi-organ, and this is a nice example. Interesting, large tumor, exophytic, ulcerating, but there's no evidence of bowel obstruction. Or look at this lesion in this case. It's hard to tell where things begin and end here. But look at this large ulcerating mass that was a B-cell lymphoma. Look at the size of that tumor. So you can get a feel of the, the variable. In this case, you can see this SMV and SMA encasement. And then, of course, the classic sign with lymphoma, the sandwich sign where you see the mass and you see the encasement of the patient's mesenteric vessels, nicely shown there in the coronal view as well. So you get a very good feel of the pattern of involvement. Lymphoma, common to see nodes in the mesentery more than other cancers, but also often large infiltrating tumors. And lymphoma is one of the lesions that gives intussusceptions. You can see multiple intussusceptions here, and lymphoma is one of the classic things that in metastasis for giving multiple intussusceptions. The last thing I'll comment on is metastasis. And we typically don't think about METs, but when people are living longer with better treatments, you see a different pattern of disease. So we see lots of METs these days from a range of tumors. I always like to think about melanoma. We talk about METs as intraperitoneal seeding and hematogenous spread and direct extension. And so intraperitoneal, classic ovary, hematogenous, think melanoma, direct extension, think pancreatic cancer. Patient with um, GI bleeding, history of renal cancer, you see that lesion in the patient's small bowel? We always think about patients 10 years out getting metastasis to the pancreas. They also get small bowel mets. They also get gastric mets, but a very nice example here, a little over one centimeter vascular lesion, nicely shown there. And here's a patient with melanoma, abdominal pain. There's that classic intussusception, that telescoping. Here it is on the cinematic. You see the vessels being drawn in. There's the mass. And here it is again with a crescent sign. And melanoma is, is something we commonly see at times. No one remembers the patient had melanoma and at times the diagnosis has not been made. Melanoma is also one of the lesions that's multiple. It often presents in funny ways. This pre patient presented with jaundice and uh, look at this large mass. I thought it might be a gist tumor. This was metastatic melanoma. So it can be tricky at times and you need to be very, very careful. And look at the size of that lesion. And I've now seen a number of lesions looking exactly like that. So I've gone through a number of cases
I've looked at many of the different tumors of small bowel, ranging from adenocarcinoma to carcinoids to GIST tumors to metastatic disease to lymphoma. And you can see just a very good pattern of disease. Here's an example of metastasis by direct extension from pancreatic cancer. Again, we've emphasized the importance of protocols. We've emphasized the importance of being very careful. A large mass like this with obstruction is easy. It's the small lesions where I think we make the most uh, impact on patient care. So uh, that's kind of a quick look at, uh, at small bowel tumors. It's worthwhile to look at a lot of cases. I know for the residents, you need to look at a lot of cases to see the various appearances, but also to look at the subtle cases because the subtle cases are really where things are missed and we can make the most uh, best impact on our patient. So with that, I thank you for paying attention and uh, have a great day.